Hi everybody, welcome to our lecture on rotational mechanics. Um, focusing particularly today on the idea of something called torque and how it affects the process of equilibrium. So torque. Um, this is one of those terms you hear a lot. Um, I often think it's funny that when you watch a commercial for like a pickup truck, they like to tell you how it has a lot of torque. Equally, they'll say the same thing for a sports car. It has a lot of torque. Okay, so what is this big pickup truck and a sports car have even in common that they would both need a lot of torque? Well, it has a lot to do with what torque actually is. Torque is kind of like a turning force. Okay, and here's what I mean. Okay, let's say you've got a bolt you need to tighten. Um, and it's difficult to do just with your hand because when you grab your hand, you've got it twisted and it can be often uncomfortable and even painful to try to do that. So what do you do? You go and get a wrench. And now what the wrench does for you, that's my wrench, um, is it allows you to apply your force out here, okay? Instead of having to try to apply your force directly to the little nut itself, or the bolt itself, um, it allows you to apply your force at a much larger distance than you would if you had to try to apply your force right there. Okay, So you don't want to do that. We don't want to apply the force right there because it makes it very difficult to turn. But when we apply it to the end of the wrench, it suddenly becomes very easy to turn this. Okay, So that force and that distance, or that sort of radius there, because it will turn in a circle, um, seems to give you a lot more leverage in order to turn it. And that's basically where the idea of torque comes in. Torque is the product of the amount of force you apply and the distance between where the force is applied and what's called the axis of rotation, basically where you're turning around. And it gives you an equation for torque. Torque, which is given by the Greek letter tau, is force times distance, or radius, times the sine of the angle at which you apply it. And the units of torque is the newton meter. Now, be very careful here because, remember, force times distance, that was also work, okay, which is in joules. But torque is not in joules. Okay, this is important. Even though a joule and a newton meter are actually the same type of unit, um, torque and work are not the same thing. Okay, keep in mind they are not the same thing. So in our example here, if we had tried to apply our force right here to try to twist that, well then the distance to the axis of rotation, now the axis of rotation is kind of your center of your circle if you were going to make a circle here, that would be very small. And if torque is force times distance times the sine of your angle. Um, even with a big force, that little distance yields very little torque, very little ability to turn. Okay, so by increasing the distance, and that's where the wrench comes in, um, you're able to get more torque simply by increasing distance. Okay? So now, for example, if you've ever had to change a tire, and I highly recommend everybody, once you start driving, learn how to change a tire. Um, what you'll actually see is they have this device that goes all the way around this thing, but then it has a huge bar that comes out from it. Okay, And again, that allows even someone who's not that strong, by having that long bar there, the ability to apply a large amount of torque. Okay? Now, where does that angle come in? Well, as we should know by now, You'll notice that this angle between the force and the axis of rotation, okay, that line up to the center, is 90 degrees. Okay, and the sine of 90 degrees is always 1. Okay? Now, if you take the sine of anything that is less than 90 degrees, you'll get something less than 1. Okay? So your maximum torque occurs at 90 degrees, always. And if you try it, now, Interestingly enough, if you were to try to take your sort of bolt here and you took your wrench and you applied your force right there, 
Okay. Well, that's right along the axis, and that gives you an angle of zero degrees. Well, the sine of zero degrees is zero. Because okay. you would just be pushing on it. You wouldn't be turning anything. Okay. So there would be actually no torque. Okay. So your maximum torque is at 90. Your zero torque is at zero degrees. So let's look at a couple of examples. Opening a door. Okay. Well, let's say our door is about um, 1.2 meters long. And we have the ability to apply only 6 newtons of force as we push on the doorknob. Okay. Now, it's going to rotate around the hinges. Okay. So let's say at one point one person comes and applies that force right there. But another person kind of comes walking up and applies the force like this at an angle of, let's say, 60 degrees. Torque, FR, sine theta. Okay. So the torque on the one on the left would be the amount of force, 6 newtons, the distance, 1.2 meters, the distance to the rotation point, the axis. And then the angle here is 90 degrees. That gives a torque of 7.2 newton meters. However, on the other door, same force, same distance, but now it's applied at a smaller angle. That gives you 6.24 newton meters of torque. Okay. So again, to always get your maximum torque requires that you apply your force at 90 degrees. Anything less will lower your torque. That's basically all there is to calculating a basic torque. At this point in my class, I usually tell this story. Um, if you ever watched the movie Jurassic Park, the original Jurassic Park from a long time ago, there's a great scene where uh, they're in the control room and the one kid's on the computer trying to boot up the computer to lock the doors because there's a velociraptor outside the door. And so it's pushing on the door, and the one guy gets, and he's pushing against the door, and he dropped his gun on the way to getting there. And then his partner, she comes over, and she's on the floor with her back right against practically the hinges. And he tells her to get the gun, and she says, no, um, i got to help you keep the door closed. But she's pushing on the hinges, so she's not really creating any torque at all. So she's not helping. Um, what she should do is you know, get up and get the gun and blast the velociraptor. Now the important thing is how we relate torque into this idea of equilibrium. Now we discussed equilibrium earlier in the year, but there were a couple properties whenever you had equilibrium. First of all, when something was in equilibrium, it could not accelerate. Now that did not mean it was at rest. It could be at rest, but it also could be moving at a constant velocity. But the two primary conditions for equilibrium now that we understand torques can be involved is first of all, the sum of all forces acting on the object must be zero. Okay, we already know that from when we studied the idea of equilibrium under forces. The net force must be zero. There can be all kinds of forces acting, but when they all add up, they have to add to zero. That will lead to no acceleration. The second condition, though, now that there is this idea of torque, is that the sum of all torques acting the object must also be zero. Okay? And again, that means that there is no rotational acceleration. Now again, something could be spinning, um, but it has to rotate at a constant velocity, even with torques applied to it. But we're going to look at it in terms of sort of a static equilibrium, okay, where things really aren't moving around. And to do that, one of the things we also have to bring up again was Newton's idea of center of mass. And Newton said that the center of mass is the point where all the mass of an object is concentrated and where all forces are sort of considered to act upon. And it's also the location where torques can kind of act around. Okay? And this is sort of the way that we can balance things out. So let's sort of look at this uh, simulation here to get a basic idea of how to maintain equilibrium with torques. Now, one way is pretty obvious. For example, um, if I take a 10 kilogram mass, and I put it on this seesaw at one meter, it takes it out of equilibrium, it's not equilibrium. 
So equally, if I take another 10 kilogram mass and put it at the same location, well, now we have equilibrium. Okay? It's perfectly balanced out. But what if instead of having two 10 kilogram masses, I have one 10 kilogram one and one 5 kilogram one? Well, if I put the 5 kilogram one there, it didn't balance it out, did it? So what do I need to do? Well, if I move it closer, well, that didn't do anything. But moving closer seems to reduce my torque. If I move it farther away, oh, that increased my torque to balance it out. Now let's look at the sort of logic of this. The weight of this is twice the weight of this. Yeah, I'm calling, saying weight even though it is mass, but the weight and mass are related. So the distance here is twice the distance of that. Okay, and that seems to make sense because force times distance would equal force times distance. Okay, so if I double the force on one side, I double the distance on the other side, and I get this idea of equilibrium. So let's look at that idea in terms of the situation here. Um, so let's say that we've got someone sitting on a seesaw, and they have a mass of about 40 kilograms. And they're sitting two meters from the, what's the fancy name is the fulcrum, uh, but essentially the balance point here. Now, along comes our friend here, who let's say has a mass of 60 kilograms, and wants to hop on the seesaw at the correct spot so that everything will be in equilibrium. Okay. Now, how to figure that out? Well, let's look at a free body diagram to start here, okay, once that other person sits on here. Now, if we were to consider all the forces that we're acting, well, first of all, we would have the weight of our person, mg, on the left. We'll have the weight, once they're on there, of our other person on the right. But that's not the only forces, because notice that the seesaw has to have mass. So, of course, it has weight. Now, we consider its weight to occur at the center of mass of the seesaw. Now, fortunately, that's also where this little fulcrum is. Now, the seesaw sitting on the fulcrum, those are surfaces in contact. That must mean there's a normal force acting upward. Now, let's look at our two rules for equilibrium. Well, the first rule says that the sum of all forces has to equal zero. Okay, well, let's do that. If I add up all my forces in the x direction, well, there aren't any. Okay, there's nothing acting horizontally, so that's already zero for us. That's nice. If I add up all the forces in the vertical direction, well, I've got one, two, three forces all pushing down and one normal force pushing up. So the normal is positive, m1g, m2g, and m3g are all down. They all equal zero because the system is in equilibrium. There is no acceleration. In fact, everything is at rest. Now, notice what that equation actually is going to tell me, that the normal force is equal to the sum of all of the weights. And that makes sense because when that, that person sits on there and everybody's there, that little fulcrum there is holding up the weight of everything. So what that would actually tell us, if we wanted to know, is the actual value of the normal force. We have mass 1, 40, times gravity, mass 2, 60, times gravity, and we have mass 3, which is the seesaw itself. We can't ignore that, all times gravity. And so that tells us we have about 1,200 newtons of force that that fulcrum is having to support. Okay. So what we've done is actually answered our second question here. What is the normal force applied by the fulcrum? Okay. Didn't even know we were looking for that, but apparently we were. So what about the first question? How do we figure out where our friend is going to sit to perfectly balance that out? Well, that's where the sum of my torques 
come in. Now, here's where we have to be really careful. The center of mass of the seesaw is right here. And notice that the normal force and the weight both act at that point. Now, that means they cannot create any torque because R is zero for those two. Okay? There is no distance between their force and the center of rotation, or the axis of rotation. So they can't create a torque. However, mass one is going to cause the board to go this direction, okay, counterclockwise. Mass two is going to cause the board to try to rotate the other way, clockwise. So we have a torque here, and we have a torque here. Now they're in opposite directions. So technically, when I sum my torques, I could say that torque one is positive, but then that makes torque two negative, okay, because they're acting in opposite directions. They're rotating in opposite directions. But what that tells me is that they need to be equal, to be balanced. And that makes sense, doesn't it? So this is F times R sine theta. This is F times R sine theta. Now, you'll notice that both of the forces are acting 90 degrees to the um, seesaw, so we'll ignore the sine theta because that's going to equal 1. They're going to be equal to each other. Now, but what are those forces? Well, they're weight. So where force is, I can replace it with actually weight, mg, because that's really what it is. So now we have m1g times its distance on one side, and m2g times its distance on the other side. Now you want to be fancy? Cancel G, because gravity is the same on both sides. And that, of course, makes sense, too. So now we have our 40-kilogram person sitting at 2 meters. And on the other side, we have our 60-kilogram person at some unknown distance. And that tells us that our friend needs to sit 1.33 meters from the balance point, from the fulcrum. And that makes sense because our friend has a larger mass, so they must sit closer in order to balance it out. And that's really all there is to that. So let's take a slightly trickier example. In this case, instead of two, I have three objects. Okay? Mass one is 20 kilograms and is sitting 60 centimeters from the fulcrum. Mass 2 is 40 kilograms and is sitting 20 centimeters from the fulcrum. And mass 3, we don't know what it is, but we want to put it 50 centimeters on the other side. So the question is, how much does mass 3 need to be in order to balance that out? Okay. All right, so I've made my free body diagram here. So let's look at that real quick. So we've got the weight, m1g here. We've got the other weight, m2g here. We've got this weight on the other side, m3g here. We have the normal force created by the fulcrum. Um, we have the weight of the balance beam, which I didn't get. And I don't need it because I'm actually not looking for normal force here, so it's not important. Um, because we know that when it comes to the idea of torque, these guys aren't going to create a torque because they're right there at that center point. But in terms of torques, mass 1 creates a torque counterclockwise, and so does mass 2 because they're on the same side. Mass 3 creates a torque that goes clockwise. So the sum of my torques has to equal zero. Well, that means if I sum my torques, I have one and two acting together, and three opposing it. Or torque one plus two gives me torque three. Torque one would be its force times its distance sine theta. I'm going to ignore that. They're all 90 degrees. Torque 2 would be however much force times its distance, 
torque 3, its force times its distance. And once again, here the forces are all weights. So M1G times its distance, R1, M2G, R2, equals M3G, R3. Again, I'm going to cancel my G out here. Okay. Now remember, I can, I can cancel G in this situation. If I was looking for normal force, I cannot cancel weight or gravity when I'm finding a normal force. Now I'll put in the values. This is 20. 60 centimeters is 0.6 meters. This is 40 kilograms. 20 centimeters is 0.2 meters. Over here we have our unknown mass. We don't know how much it is, but we do know we want to put it 50 centimeters or 0.5 meters. So that gives me 12 plus 8. Or the mass that I can put on that other side will be 40 kilograms. If I want to place it at exactly 50 centimeters to balance it out. So as you can see, using the idea of equilibrium and torques, you can find either what distance to place a specific mass, or if you want to balance something out, how much mass you have to place at a particular distance. So if you go back to my original premise of the pickup truck and the sports car, why they both advertise they want to have a lot of torque, well again, the idea of torque being a turning force, okay? Uh, force times distance. Well, a truck wants to have a lot of turning force on its axle because it's going to carry a very heavy load. So it needs a lot of torque in order to push that truck forward and uh, get it to move. A sports car, which is much lighter, wants to go really fast. So it's going to want a lot of torque in order to get a lot of force to get a very large acceleration. Okay? Pickup truck doesn't have a lot of acceleration because it's going to be hauling a lot of mass under that torque. But a sports car, which has a real low mass, will get a really big acceleration if there's a lot of torque to the axle. And that's basically the idea of torques and how it relates to equilibrium. All right, we'll see you next time.